Good evening, my name's Mark Zegfeldt. Welcome to Ziggy's World, where I will be interviewing people from the Scottish political scene. Tonight, I'll be talking with Mark Devlin from The Majority Show. We'll be back in one minute. Good evening, Mark. How are you? Yeah, I'm not too bad, thanks. How are you doing today? Yes, very good, thank you. Now, um, I want to talk to you first about uh, your show, The Majority Show, sure. uh, which goes out on Wednesdays at 7pm. That's if right. You, if you haven't uh, watched it, please go and do. It's a great show. Uh, so, Mark, how, how did you get started with uh, The Majority Show and what, what made you... Uh, uh, well, sure. I don't know if you can remember, but a few years ago, um, I'd say almost four years ago, the pro-UK side in the, I don't know, in this whole discussion about uh, whether Scotland should be independent or the UK should be broken up or not, this whole discussion, the UK side was very, very demoralized and beaten down. And I was on Twitter a lot at that time. And people, you know, you just, they didn't, there was a feeling that nobody was there to represent anyone. And so I thought, well, okay, what I can do is I'm, I'm on Twitter anyway. I might as well give it a go. And so actually I thought that I would do something a bit like what you're doing uh, is to make some rants. And so I started by making a minute long rants uh, and it took me ages to make each one, edit them. It was just a disaster really. And um, But then after a few weeks, I realized, well, actually, I've got a lot of experience in publishing online uh, and making online magazines and all kinds of websites and so on. So I thought, well, actually, what we'll do is I'll make a magazine, basically an online magazine for uh, to get the um, start getting editors, writers and so on. Uh, and, and we start writing some positive stories about where we're at but so and try and improve the situation, get morale boosted a little bit. And so that was the first part. And then as I went along, I began to realize I could do a bit more than that. And we started to get followers. It was really great that people supported us at the beginning. You probably found that yourself, people on Twitter who are really helpful and giving you more support, you know, we all know the big uh, Twitter accounts, they were really great at giving, giving us followers, even though we didn't really know what we were doing. You've got over, uh, what, 2,000 subscribers now? Well, we've got that on uh, um, for the show. Um, and then we have, but we get, well, te we get probably ten to 15,000 views per show on various platforms. Actually, it's mainly viewed on Facebook. Uh, we have 30,000 followers, and we have 30,000 followers also on uh, Twitter, 32,000. Why do you think it's so successful? Well, I think the main thing was that we were uh, forthright in fighting the nationalists. And we have, or I have in particular, a uh, strong philosophical backing in it that I think nationalism or ideological backing I should say that that nationalism itself is the problem and I think that had been that had been forgotten in what we had uh, in 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 all these periods and the nationalism had grown up around people in Scotland but they didn't really feel it that much or understand it that much now I'd been overseas for a long time I was 26 years away and then when I came back, I was like, what's going on here? This is unbelievable. There's just casual racism, anglophobia, uh, greed, all this kind of stuff had been normalized. And I was really like quite shocked. And so I could see it and that we often describe that to people as the, the boiling frog syndrome, that the people, the frogs in the pot are getting the heat turned up on them all the time, but they don't feel it because it's just incremental to them whereas someone from the outside goes well these pop these frogs are you know boiling away they're going to die soon so really that feeling and so that it really it really struck us when we came back what's going on here this is just you know actually quite shocking so that was one part of it another part so we could come out with a clear ideological basis for what we were doing and nationalism itself the thing you'd forgotten was bad is the bad thing and even what's underpinning nationalism as well 
with selfishness and greed, building a wall, all this type of stuff that people had kind of forgotten about. It's so obvious almost. And then one of the things that the beyond that that was very very good at has been I've been having been marketing consultants for a long time is that we can make direct messages. So very much like. Uh, and you can see that in our billboards, for example, with Resign Sturgeon. I was just them. I was right. just them. Uh, who, who, how did you come up with that idea to do the billboards in the first place? Because they're very, they were, they were, they're very um, direct and very um, successful in get, uh, getting the mass message across. Well, um, it wasn't actually our idea. I mean, I think everyone had wanted to do billboards. We talked with some of the other groups and they had wanted to do billboards. And it came to a point where one of the other groups, Scotland Matters, actually had had, had did do a billboard and I designed it for them. And it was quite successful, quite a lot of PR. And so and also it managed to raise some money. So we thought, okay, well, let's let's try, you know, one one of ours. And we tried the first one was Resign Sturgeon, uh, and and it was very successful. Um, we ran it a few years later, of course, and we and when we did that, it was extremely successful because it ran just you know, the day before uh, Nicholas Sturgeon did actually resign. So we at that point there was we were trying different things. We did the uh, we also did that banner that flew across the um, uh, what's it called uh, over the Scottish Parliament building. And a lot of what we were trying to do at that point was really just trying to bolster our own side. And mm. try to say that you know you're not alone. Yeah, there's other people around you. We are the majority. This is this is a this is a common fight, right? And and we we can we can be a voice for you. And that kind of developed, I think. So well, what I like about it is you get um, you get people involved. With the comments and with um, um, what Mary do, does with the comments and reading the comments out and putting the comments on 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 your on on the on the um, on the front, uh, it gets it gets a lot of people. They feel as if they are part of the show. They are in the yeah, show. Yeah, well, we've always been like that. It didn't matter what we did when we did our magazine in Japan or we did some pro other projects. Always trying to involve people in the in the process and 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 get them involved because you know it's interesting things come up from that and it doesn't really just belong to us that's what i said we're trying to bolster the community and try to say to people as i said like there's more that we there's there's actually a majority of us here this is another thing that people had forgotten i mean the reason we're called that is because we the people had forgotten that we were the majority we had the power but we didn't actually have the power when well, away we we have Sorry. the power right but we, the SNP didn't have a majority, but they had the political power. But we had people power, I suppose. Yeah. You can say that, right? Uh, I wanted to ask um, people see the finished article, see the show. How much work goes in to making the show? Uh, behind the scenes, how long does it take? Well, you? I mean, basically, it takes up a whole way. There's two parts to it, three parts, I suppose. There's the preparation, then there's the actual show, and then there's the, I guess, kind of like the, the the sending out information about the show to our registered users and so on. So yeah. it takes up a whole day, basically, to do the mm. show. We start uh, early on on the Wednesday. We write an outline for it and if there's any guests on we get them involved you, if you're on we ask you to do uh, your segment and get some talking points in there uh, uh, and then of course uh, so we write that all up and we have a, a script that comes to like 20 pages we don't follow it exactly it's just more like a lot of bullet points but there's a lot of them and uh, then we have to prepare all the uh, all the captions and all the uh, video clips and so on so that takes straight up to the show usually when it comes to the start of the show we're really in a big rush um, and uh, and then the show we do the show and then after the show I have to uh, do various things on YouTube there's a thing called doing uh, I cut it up into 
the, the, the video out into what they call chapters. They have to send an email out to all the uh, all of our followers, put social media posts and so on. So it basically takes all day um, to do it. Brilliant. Um, well, we're going to take a small break. And then after this break, we're going to talk about uh, the main topic, which is the fall and rise of Nicola Sturgeon. So we'll be okay. back in a minute. Welcome back. Now, Mark, uh, the main put the main the main topic: the fall sure. and rise of Nicola Sturgeon. Okay. Now, I want to take you back to 2014, uh, the referendum. We win. Sure. By a huge, a, a big margin. Uh, Alex Salmond resigns. Then up steps the deputy Nicola Sturgeon. Uh, no leadership. Debates, no debates, no leadership contest. She's crowned the leader of the party and the first minister. What were your first thoughts when you knew you know that Sturgeon was taken over? What 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 did you and with, especially with uh, the language she was using of we are going to respect the vote, uh, we're going to um, I'm going to do politics differently. And I will be the first minister for everyone. What what did you initially think of Sturgeon at that time? Well, to be honest, we weren't really here, right? As, as I said, we were overseas, so we we were watching from afar. I mean, we of course we were in uh, keeping tabs on the independence referendum and trying to find it because it was kind of worrying for us uh, being overseas. I mean, we had been away for a long time. It's true. But at the same time, we were getting a thing, We our identity and our passports and all these type of things were going to change. And these are big issues when you're overseas. You want to be sh- sure that your things are secure in that sense. But also, basically, you're Brit- well, what are you going to be? You're going to take away your British identity. And I'm like, well, this is, you know, I don't want to have a Scottish identity, a Scottish-only identity. I'm Scottish and British. So I don't want to have that. I, get, I like the benefits of having both. So there was all that going on. And at then, any time, course, at any time while you were uh, abroad, was there any time you thought, "Wow, they could win this," or did you or, did you think all along that, "No, we're going to um, the Scottish people will vote for staying in the UK," or did you think at some time did you think, "Wow, this is closer"? Or um, I mean, of course, there was polling beforehand. The you know the famous polling that you know, get everyone panicked and, and made them do the vow. And I thought that was completely unnecessary. Um, I don't think there was any need to do that, just further appeasement. So I I just felt that uh, I didn't think that they would win. Uh, I, 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 think, I didn't think it would be particularly close. It wasn't particularly close, really. Um, and so it was a big relief. Now, skip forward to a few years, 2016, we come back. Nicola Sturgeon's been in position for a while, and then we're seeing the results of that. We're seeing that, wait a minute, this hasn't disappeared, this issue. We're seeing uh, Nicola Sturgeon just going on about second referendum, which was the, the big thing at that point. We're agitating for a second referendum. We're like, well, we don't want a second referendum. We had one already. And this whole idea where the nationalists were saying, well, if you're so afraid of one, why don't you give us one? And you're like, okay, no, losers don't make terms. That's not the way it works. So, But there's over so many of them thinking that and such a weight or pressure of this kind of constant agitation and propaganda while on our side the opposition didn't know how to react and as I often say that the uh, the nationalists behave as though they won the referendum and the opposition behaved as though it lost so then we had the uh, Smith Commission and we had all that not giving them more and more stuff and anyone knows that why would we why would you give them that Basically, when they lost, it should have been shut down straight away. And even if it hadn't been shut down, uh, no, if, if 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 it had been a bit slow, it's slow, they'd been a bit slow in the uptake. Surely, by that point, two thousand sixteen, they would have seen that this what a mess this was, and try, went to close it down. So, for that reason, we were we were, and also we're trying to figure out how to do more tactical voting um, and how to. How to boost the, how to promote 
pro-UK policy. How do you make everyone stronger? As I said, most of our job was really early days and still is to bolster our side. If you've got a strong core, then you know you can fight. But people were demoralized and they were tired and they were they weren't as scared because they knew that it wouldn't get anywhere further, but they were just tired and bored of it almost in a way. And and we needed to actually get some what's the word, uh, v- 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 revival or, v- or life into it, you know, and say, we actually, you know, as I say, we're the majority. Why, why are we, why are we feeling acting as though we're not? Why is we feeling as though we're lost? During the early times of Sturgeon, did, was it frustrating for you um, to see how the media reacted to Sturgeon, uh, how they put her on a, on a pedestal? They never, they never really challenged her and she built this aura around herself of being this politician that people feared for some reason. And, 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 and not just in Scotland, across the UK, the media, was that a, a bit of a frustration? Could, could you see that? Did you see that? Oh yeah, of course. I mean, that's the that's one of the other things. The media has been acted disgracefully in all, all of this. Now, I ran a media watch before. I've ran I, in Japan. I ran a newspaper, you know, an online newspaper. It became the number one uh, English newspaper in Japan. So, you know, I've 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 worked with journalists. I've worked with people and uh, like that. And I, and I've I've been watching media for year and years and. It's, it was very clear that the media had capitulated to her, and not none so more obvious than, for example, in the Times, which you know, and in the end, I end up, end up writing an article of calling them the Times Appeasement Division because they would constantly write articles that were saying, "Well, uh, you, we want a better nationalism." Or we want uh, we want these people to succeed somehow. If only they could do better than what they're currently doing. You're like, wait a minute, that's not that doesn't help the situation actually, because the core of it, the core of nationalism, to my mind, is toxic, building barriers, uh, selfishness, greed. All these things are embedded in it. So you can't get it doesn't get any better. And we've seen by the, the the type of people that have been attracted to it, and all the scandals and all the incompetence and so on that 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 playing out. But um, so, I mean, it got to the point where we had uh, Piers Morgan saying that uh, she was more competent. Oh, if only had a leader like uh, Nicola down here. Now Boris Johnson was might about let's say is one of those type of shambolic leaders, like right? now. I think that the, that leaders like that are often misunderstood and that they, they present themselves to be kind of shambolic but actually can make good decisions. Where in to contrast with people like Sturgeon, Obama, people like that who've got very strong profile and uh, you know tick all the boxes but their policies are absolutely rotten. So this is a... This is a, a challenge we have in politics because we've got the, the how something looks and how something acts. And we saw that in, in, that played out in Nicola Sturgeon's case in the end with her arrest and so on and the fall from grace because it was, it was all uh, style of a kind and not actually much substance there at all. And in fact, in the end, it just becomes more and more how can, how can you present these things more and more in a positive light rather than actually doing any of the work behind them. What, what did you make of um, the Scottish media and uh, the, the, the amount of, like, for starters, STV and the, uh, the National and other, other organisations in Scotland who receive large sums of money from the Scottish government or the SNP? Is it not a bit of, um, you know... You, and, and they back the SNP to the hilt with stories. Mm-hmm, Is that not course. it? Uh, how did you make of that? What did you make of that? And how how do you feel about that? Well, money talks. I mean, it's straightforward. If someone's giving you a lot of money, you don't you don't you don't talk back to them because you lose the money. Allowed that kind of, they, they, especially the money that STV receive. We're talking um, twenty odd million pounds. A year that that, that the, SN, um, the Scottish government paid them, 
should that so the, that is challenging but i think the, the issue is is wider than just the media i mean basically what we've seen in the past i don't know how many years 10 years or so is the snp basically putting its fingers putting putting its fingers into all aspects of civil society so we have the situation you know we for example uh, they've got they fund uh, so many organisations, for example, to do with LGBT and transgender issues and so on, then those agencies make uh, recommendations to the government, right? And, of course, they make the recommendations that the government wants. And then the government says, well, these are the recommendations by these groups. So it's a, that type of uh, third sector corruption is very you know, is entrenched now. In fact, and we see people like, or in the drugs issue, we see people who are on the ground and trying to get things done. Anne-Marie Ward and some other people we know uh, who can't can't get any funding because they speak up. Well, it's not part. It's, there's a, as I, I suppose it's not because they speak up they don't get the money, but they're not in. This, they're not in the in this in the in the in the scheme as it were. Well, we, right? are, we do know, and we have seen instances uh, even at council level where uh, the, the, the harassment of um, charities that if, and they do get documents saying um, you will receive this funding, but you are not allowed to criticize the Scottish government. Yeah, of course. Yeah, it goes through that. I heard a story, I mean, from first-hand story from someone in the arts, and they basically said that if you were to get any money from Creative Scotland, then you had to basically, might say you're writing a play, you had to kind of mention uh, independence in there somewhere or you know pause be positive to the Scottish government we've seen that whole capitulation of the arts as well we've got uh, you know famous comedians um not so famous comedians who basically will not speak up against the, the Scottish government because the Scottish government uh controls the c- controls their their funding to some extent or controls the funding of even of the venues that they go to and so on so and also, there the, the fear. I think that was another thing uh, when we first started. There was a fear of speaking up. Now, when we first started, so many people said, "Don't just don't do this, Mark. This is a bad idea." They said, and "They said you you're going to get your windows broken in. You're going to have you people being you know aggressive at you in the street and all this type of stuff." And uh, and I was like, oh, oh, "I don't know if you should do this or not." Right? I mean, that was a genuine fear, right. and that was that was. Also, I wouldn't say like to say that was one of the reasons because that because I heard that I wanted to do it, right? But it's a consideration. But the the the, the fact is that you you know we should be doing it because of that the type of reaction. That how what type of society we're in if that was the actual reaction? But it turns out they're a paper tiger. This is what I keep saying to people they they appear to be very strong. Sturgeon appeared to be strong. The party appeared to be strong. The whole presentation was that this is these are people who are you know have got you know some kind of power behind them, but they didn't have anything at all, and the, all they had was so much bluster, and and all that of course was to hide incompetence and scandal and so on, just what, exactly what you would expect. So now we're years on, and we're like, okay, well, well, okay, people forget what it was like before. Now if you go into Twitter now and you talk, you you say something like, you know, I think the UK should be. Uh, you know, stay together. It's not the same, nearly the same level of aggression we had a few years ago. And 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 if you do get some posts back, then it's it's uh, Russian bots or stuff like that. They're so fake, you can tell, right? But yeah. before it was real people. Yeah. Right, and 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 you could see them, and they were making videos, and they were they were making blogs, and they were all excited, and they were doing that. But now there's no real people. Do Do you think this came from the top? from Sturgeon, uh, from uh, Sturgeon's husband, who ran, the, who ran the SNP. Do you think this kind of um, temperature in Scotland, the, the, the aggressiveness, the, the attacks on the media, uh, we saw it with a lady that left for America uh, um, because she attacked Sturgeon and Sturgeon hit back, and then suddenly she was she received death threats and all yeah, sorts. Yeah. Now, now, of course, it comes from the top. It comes from the top. You see, you see, um, Hamza Yusuf today when he's when he's when he's asked about the front page of the P and J, which had the traitors cover, 
on yeah. it, saying uh, Keir Starmer and his uh, top uh, top team were traitors to the northeast. I think uh, a disgraceful uh, cover, anyway. But he was asked to disavow that, and he and he was like, "No, I think it's the right thing." So basically, we've had Sturgeon saying that the uh, she hates Tories. And then we have Hamza Yusuf saying that Labour are traitors. And they're like, are these the people that we, we feel are supposed to try and bring this country together? It's, it's nonsense, right? You don't, I think even Obama, Obama said you can't, you, you can't divide people to try and bring them together later. Yeah. It doesn't work that way. No. no, right? no. You bring people together, maybe later things fall apart. But there's no, never anything of that. She always ran the her fiefdom as it were for her followers i don't actually think she really did in the and that was only even a subset of her followers in the end uh what you might say the woke brigade as it were and but so she never ran it for the rest the rest of you she never come out and said you know what i think we should um we should just put part this divisive nonsense to the side and try and make a better scotland i mean everyone says that if they had uh, if they had spent the past 15 years building up the country, then, it, of course, people might say, all right, let's have actually done a good job. Well, maybe it might be okay to be... Do you, think, do you, think, do you think the line of attack and uh, the rhetoric we used was to try and cover the um, the failures in the policies that were coming out of the SNP? Oh, of course, yeah, of course. Oh, best form, yeah, best form of defence is attack. I mean, that's what it was about. You, 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 you behave aggressively towards the press so that when so that they'll just be like oh, I, don't, I don't really want to ask her questions and i have to say you know you know to the people who have did stand up against her um channel four news uh some of the other journalists uh you know they did a great they did a great job and they've been quite vindicated now but the ones who didn't and who are still um appeasing and who are still uh, capitulating to it it's just you know it's it's just shameful. It's it's really shameful. What what do you, um, what role do you think the UK government have played in allowing uh, Sturgeon to act in the way she's acted over ten years without impunity whatsoever? Uh, do you, what role do you think the UK government's played in that? Do you think they've appeased her too much and gave too much? And well, I think in the initial stages, the the, the, the there was too much appeasement. The problem was once they were strong, it was harder to push back because they would use the nationals would use any any excuse to rally the troops. And if you can imagine, let's say that they were at fifty percent in the polls, and they could take any perceived slight and amplify it because there was quite a lot of people there at that point, and they could get up to say they they didn't, but uh, they could get much higher and they could get momentum. That's the thing. So I think the UK government, by kind of ignoring Scotland, actually in that sense, or ignoring Sturgeon, um, basically did the right thing. I mean, now we sitting here, we think, oh, they should have taken more action. Now, the time not for action... pushed what, back a little bit earlier, though, when in, in her reign, uh, when she crossed over into, say, reserved powers, yes. like she did. Do you think... Well, I think they should have done it. I think they should have made it so that that was clear from the start of devolution. Right, and from the start of the parliament, they let them run with that for far too long. That should have been done after the referendum. It should have been like, okay, that's done. No more powers. The people of Scotland have decided. That's it. But they were still scared of them because they had at that point they still had momentum. So the the nationalists still had momentum. So what happened then was we built up these. They had momentum, but in the end, they ran into a brick wall. Because the brick wall was always there, right? Because they couldn't, they would never have got that. Uh, they could never have a second referendum on their own. They would have had to have it with the UK's backing. And but I think to some extent the UK should, needs to firm up and say, look, we are one country. We have some devolved administrations. We're going to have more of these devolved administrations. They can't be agitating to leave the country. That's not what they're for. And 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 start to say. And start to start to think about what the what the not the borders are, but what what what's the what's the kind of people? Well, not so much that. What's the what what's it what's it for? What's the what are the different um, 
what's the limits of each thing properly? And and part of that, I think, is for the UK government to say, and it's, it's clearly that this is what devolution is for, and this is we won't tolerate trying to break up this country from within. Right, well, I want to move it a bit forward to Sturgeon's later years. Uh, she's been in office uh, for um, seven, eight, eight years, nine years, uh, and she's starting to show the cracks are starting to show. Well, when, <laughs> I'm not when, saying it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> right. When, okay. The, the cracks. Well, I don't know. Actually, I think for most people, in, a time could be coming to an end here. This is, the, you know, she's getting um, things are starting to to show in 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 her because she she did change over time, and I think come especially over COVID, she looked a little bit, you know. Uh, I can see things happening in the future, and and her power seemed to be starting to wane. Well, I don't know. I don't know about that. I think during that she was very strong during COVID. The English no, media I mean, loved after, her just after COVID. Just after. Yeah, COVID. I mean, at that point, she was like looking for a place to go. I mean, we were saying that that she was going to go to you know big cushy UN job or international type of thing, and oh, it, it certainly looked as though she was trying to do that. I think at a certain point, these. Uh, uh, administrators, because they actually are just administrators, want to get out of Scotland and do something bigger. Like most people do, if they're successful, they want to go out and explore the world and do what, whatever opportunities there are. Fair, fair on them. But, but that's not that. That's fine if you're not the person who's responsible for what's going on. We see this with Hamza Yousaf at the moment, more concerned about what's going on in Gaza than what's going on in Scotland, because he sees himself as being an international player. Right, and he may well be an international player at some point. Uh, that's entirely. He may have a trajectory. It might work for him. Although I, I think I said on one of the last podcasts, it's like God help them if he's trying to negotiate anything, you know, with Israel or whatever. But the the point being, it seemed almost like if you, we could do with people who, in our devolved administration, which is what it is, who would actually look after what's going on in Scotland and not be thinking this is a stepping stone to go somewhere else. I mean, they basically say, we've got a job to do here. We need to fix the roads. We need to uh, run a health service. We need to make sure education is working and get away from these global... I'm, now, I'm not, a, I'm not an anti-globalist, um, but there are global movements that tend to take over and become, you know, the fashion of the day. And Gaza is one, for example. It's nothing to really to do with anyone in Scotland. The transgender issue as well. It's, it infects so few people in Scotland, and um, but becomes a political hot potato. And then there's, of course, climate change, global warming, so on as well. These are all international movements. And most people are like, well, you know, okay, I'd rather have – there was an article the other day. I, it basically said – that they're cutting teacher numbers down in Glasgow, and yet they've got enough money for another a bike lane, you know, millions for a bike lane. You're like, well, just, we don't need the bike lane. The bike lane goes down the road from me there, and I've seen two people on it in the, in the whole time I've been here. So it's, it's you know, maybe if we were, everything was going great and we had a great economy and everything else was fixed, we could have bike lanes, right? Or we could have these green initiatives or these quangos or all these these extra spending but right now we need the potholes fixed and we need the other things fixed we need teachers we need uh, nurses and so on that's the priority and i think they don't really see that they're too easily seduced by these ideas and you can see of course the effects of that in the greens uh you know takeover of the snp what what do you think because she she actually you know she got to a stage where and, and it's a famous saying that she keeps she kept saying uh, i've won uh, one of my biggest things is I've won eight elections in the world low. Do you think she got to the stage of where I'm untouchable in Scotland? I can do anything, I can say anything, and, and I'm basically untouchable. Um, no, I don't think I don't think she felt that. I think other people might have felt that. I think that 
I mean, she said she suffered from imposter syndrome, and I think that may, be, may well be true. Uh, the I think that when it came. There are just too many things, too, too, too many contradictions. The big thing that ha- the first uh, what, was trouble, the, what was the first biggest mistake that she made that started this? Well, the biggest mistake was to take the, uh, the, uh, the referendum bill to the Supreme Court. Do you think that started the ball rolling, or do you think it was a bit earlier with the introduction of the Greens into into government? No, because at that point uh, they hadn't done that much damage uh, yet. Um, I think it was a sign of weakness. I think, but it wasn't. It wasn't so so bad at that point. But I think the the real thing was taking the the, the case to the Supreme Court. It wasn't just a knockback. It was a slap in the face, and it said you are not getting the thing that you've been promising your followers now for the past however many years. At that point, she lost a whole bunch of followers. Who thought who had thought that she'd done the wrong strategy all along? She said that she should have done something at Brexit time. She'd done 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 this, done that. Of course, everyone's a uh, everyone is a, a critic. But the thing was, she couldn't actually do much more. See, mm-hmm. she'd run out of road, right? Mm-hmm. So, so she had to she had to do that. She was forced into doing that essentially to show that the, the can could still be kicked further down the road. But the Supreme Court said no. That's the end of that. That was the first problem. That showed that that, that, she, that then she had nowhere to go. Then he started Salmond, off. Salmon famously attacked. He attacked her, didn't he, by saying, "You know, the biggest political mistake he's ever seen, and it's sucking independence back." Yeah. Uh, yeah, but he wouldn't have done any better. He couldn't. Do, the thing is, they couldn't do any better because that's the rules, yeah. right? The problem they've always faced is dreams versus reality. Right, you can sell people as many dreams as you like. But at some point, it's going to hit reality. And that's what happened in the Supreme Court. It hit reality. And they said, we can't go any far- further here. This whole parliament isn't a venue or a vehicle to get independence. That's not how to do it. Do you think she was forced into doing that, to taking it to court, because she promised so many times, this is the year we're going to get in. Uh, yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. This is year. Do you think... The 2019, was it? No, 20, the last the last Hollywood election where they said, and, and I saw this quite a lot from Nationalist, one more chance, this is your yeah, last chance. of course, chance. that's the that's thing. If they don't get in this parliament, then, you know, you're going to lose my oh, vote. they'll say that next time as well. But that's the thing. It's only so much of that you can do with people, right? You can only lead them along the path for so long. And then people started to say, right, okay, well, there's no path forward here. But as an alternative, there's no alternative, right, for those voters at that time. Those voters are like, well, Labour Party is a disaster. And, of course, they've been force-fed propaganda that the Labour Party are red Tories. And everyone they don't like is, you know, as a British nationalist and is, is, you know, is an evil person. Only the people who want Scottish independence are virtuous. So basically, they've been in this bubble for a long time, and then suddenly, gradually, it looks like the Tories are going to lose and Labour's coming up, and and they're like, oh wait a minute, I can try and I could might actually be able to get rid of the Tories. I might be able to go on the winning side for a change. Okay. And that's what happened. The culmination of that, of course, was in Rutherglen and Hamilton West. But let to go back to your thing a little bit. The Supreme Court was the first, but the real key point was when she wasn't able to tell uh, in that interview. Um, I think she was in a gym or something like that, where she wasn't able to define what a a, a, a trans woman was, whether a trans woman was a woman or not, because of uh, the. Uh, Isla Bryson situation, which uh, where Isla Bryson was put into the female uh, prison. So, th- as soon as she couldn't answer that question, then they they knew the press knew that she was weak. So there was a, they'd found a question that she couldn't answer, and she would just tie herself up in knots with. She wasn't good enough to politically to get round it. She'd gone in too deep on the issue. So, so then, where the press started. Uh, finally, started to 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 um, the press turned um, more on. It. Do you think that's because they saw weakness? Yeah, of course, well, they saw weakness, and they were tired you know, as well of being browbeaten by her at every everything. The way she treated the press is disgraceful. 
um, really, just very. T- but she, I was deliberate. She'd like you know, looking down on them. You're not intelligent enough. Only people of a certain intelligence will understand this this type of stuff. And after a while, I think the public saw that as well, and were like, "Well, I mean, you know, this person's not actually a very nice person." Um, and so that wasn't that wasn't good either. But it's when she gets stuck tripped on that, and not even I think it was two or three weeks later, then she had to resign for whatever reason we don't know explicitly right now. Um, but then, of course, the whole events unfolded from there of the arrest and 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 so on. What did you, I, 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 I don't think we should really go into branch form too much because it's still a live sure. police investigation, but we can touch on it. Do, do, do you think this is a cumulative, um, because she had so much power, this is, this was inevitable. What was going, what happened was going to happen when, when you have so much power and you have that power for so long and you have a hold on, not only the party, but the party's finances. The- um, I think the main problem is not so much that, but that with nas- more with nationalism itself, if you're always blaming other people for your issues, then that's going to attract people who, bl- as, a mo- if, 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 as a movement, you're always blaming other people politically, it's going to attract people who are always blaming other people. Yeah. Right. And what kind of people does that? What kind of people are those? Those people are the liars and the cheaters and the people who want to hide a wee bit, put a wee bit over to the side. Oh, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. Someone else did it. All that. That's the problem with it. It's not be. Is is basic. Is basic. I often say nationalism is deflection, right? And nationalism is greed as well. And you put greed and deflection together. What do you get? So you get this type of situation where people are. People think, all oh, right, well, the party, the whole party's this way. And you look at the, this other guy over here. Oh, well, he's having a, an affair. Nobody cares. And the press isn't giving enough scrutiny over these things. Or look at this guy. He's stealing a wee bit of money. All right. Or we just wasted all that money there. Nobody cares, really. So they get that kind, kind of culture. And the, a culture that they're only, that, I mean, Nicola Sturgeon could be as, as you know, clean as a whistle. But the culture of the whole party, culture of nationalism, it lends itself inevitably to this type of scandal and incompetence and grift. Well, you, grift you, you look back and we look at um, some of the, and, and I've written down here some of the um, the policies and some of the failures of um, Sturgeon's time, and we start with the obvious, the ferries. Sure. And then we have the the health service, uh, the... Um, the social care promise that we're still having to, that's now uh, the price is going up and up and up and they're still not got um, uh, implemented it. You've got the uh, education, the, the dropping uh, education, once one of the uh, um, most admired educational systems in Europe, and now it's just uh, the PISA report showed it's just bottomed out completely. Mm. And it, well, they it, don't care. I mean, that's the thing. They don't actually care about... As long as you can always deflect your problems in someone else, you're not going to care about it. Well, right? have- you're going to say, oh, England's worse. or Right? That's what you're going to say. You're going to say, oh, you know, Boris is worse. That's what the whole thing's about. And in the meantime, everything goes down the toilet because you're like, everyone's so distracted. Now, this is the thing we, we, you know, I saw as well when I came back. I'm like, you know, look at, look at yourself. You know, this, this is the problem. The problem's here. And this psychology, I think one of the things that, I think people really need to understand is the psychology of these ideologies and how they work and and say, well, what, what as, as Scots, what attracted so many Scots to this? Why did so many Scots buy into this when you can see any, you know, so many people are reasonable people can see, well, this person's just, you know, just not, well, see, not going up to the responsibility, living up to the responsibilities. You see 10 years and we see all these failures in the 10 years and we have what I won elections and baby boxes as yeah, uh, right. so-called successes, which well, baby box is not in my view a success because um, it was meant to go alongside. They, they, they say, well, look at Sweden, look at Norway, then they use it, but they use it as part, one part of a 
policy, a whole range of policies over the yeah, self social yes. care. I mean, I, I don't even think it's as complicated as that. If you want to give free stuff to your newborns or women who've just had babies, families who've just had babies, then you go to the manufacturers and you go to Unilever and you go to uh, Procter & Gamble and say, we're doing this thing, we're going to give free stuff out to the to your new, newborns. Uh, you want to be part of this program? It, doesn't, it shouldn't cost anything. They'll be glad to have it. But you need, you need, and what? Why, why Sweden and Norway in these places are so successful with the social care is it's not just a baby box. It's the care and the your response of the social care behind it. The, the, well, sure. The plan, I mean, there's, they say that, but it's it's. You know, again, it's just a kind of virtue signaling policy. They say, we'll do this thing. It'll look good. It'll give us some headlines. And this is the big problem as well with this administration uh, has been just basically governance by headlines. The ferry scandal is exactly that. They wanted a good headline before the uh, before the referendum and that they could act like grown-ups. And look, now look at us where we're at. Years and years over budget, years and years late and hundreds of millions of pounds over budget, just so incompetent. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, if that was happening in the UK, the people would be fired long ago, but they were let run far too long with all these things. And only now that they're weaker can can action actually be taken against them. They were, they were too... They, it's not that they were too strong before, they had too much momentum before. But I always say to people that nationalism was a, is a brittle faith. It's, 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 it's easily broken. It's not. It's not. There's not a lot behind it. Um, so when it does start to crumble, we write and run so many articles actually uh, saying when it does start to crumble, the whole thing will just fall apart, and that's actually in the end what happened. I'm got want to go on to uh, what's your opinion of what? What is your what's the legacy? Do you think what legacy do you think Sturgeon will be left with in in at the end of the end of the day? There's still the possibility that she can be rehabilitated. Now, the pre yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, look what happened to, uh, excuse me, I've got a bit of cramp, um, but uh, look what happened to, say, Janie Godley. Now, Janie Godley put out racist, ableist, anti-gypsy, all, kinds of, all kinds of posts, and within... Surely a political career is finished. Within a few months, um, that was, yeah, perhaps, but... You know, she's still going to be fetid by certain types of people anyway. That's 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 inevitable. I mean, you see people who have, especially in the states, people who've had quite hideous failures, and they're rehabilitated to become, you know, to whatever their their cause is after a few years. Um, whether it's women's rights or transgender rights, gay rights, whatever it is, she some kind of rights that that uh, she can go on the world circuit and talk about. You know, take a, a few good apologies and. You know, I don't think there'll be, uh, you know, not apologies or some time off, maybe. And, oh, I made some mistakes and a uh, pity tour and, you know. I mean, that's the thing you have to realise. It's not necessarily that uh, that she's down and out, right? So, if she, I mean, what happens if she, if she, if the branch form thing comes back and says, look, and there was nothing going on here, then she'll be out. She'll be up in the conference and she'll be doing whatever she can. Hamza Yousaf will be saying, yeah, I supported her, I backed her. All this, I made the right decision, all that type of stuff. So you have to be very wary of thinking, just getting into a, a mindset of saying, oh, this is the co this plus this equals that because this plus it might be something else. And then that's going to make something entirely different. So I'm quite wary of that type of thing. But I think she could ease quite easily be rehabilitated. Perhaps not, of course not. She won't have the same level of power as before, but um, she might be on the TV a lot, you know, Which and giving political opinions. I mean, really, I mean, that type of thing. So when you when five, ten years into the future, what do you uh, when people look back and Sturgeon's time as first minister and the ten years, how do you think history will see Nicola Sturgeon at that time? Do you think history will be kind on her? Or do well, you I don't know. I mean, I, I, really hard on her. It's difficult to say because, as I said, you don't know how things are going to go. There are two. Uh, I mean, as as a politician and as a first minister. Well, I think that the legacy isn't good. I mean, basically, the, she wanted to be judged in education. Education is a failure. 
people will look back at this time and say, well, opponents will look back at this time and say all she did was baby boxes, right? As you as you pointed out, a cardboard box. But more than that, all the Parliament managed to come out with was a cardboard box. But that's a discussion for another day. Um, did she lead them through Scotland through the pandemic? Well, well, the, the COVID inquiry is you know casting aspersions on that, that. Do you think that um, that's really her to the the um... Uh, what's happened? What? Oh yes, of course. What's come out all, all over COVID? Yeah, of course, that because the because the thing was, if it's Ur Nicola, right, then you think that she's going to be acting in the best interests of Scotland and, and deleting the WhatsApps. Everyone knows that is not in the best interest of Scotland. That's in the best interest of Nicola Sturgeon. So, so um, I think that was that's that's actually worse to some extent, and also because she's weaker, and the press is on on top of that totally. And, and very few redeeming uh, articles or anything about that, just total condemnation, and quite rightly so. So I think that could be a big part of the legacy, and we don't know what's still to come up. But as I said, she could be rehabilitated in some way. It's not it's not straight. We can't judge what his, how history... That's why I often say to people, people go, well, you're not on the right side of history. You're like, we don't know how history is history going to judge anyone. It could be completely different. We could all be overrun by the Chinese, for example. And, you know, they, they're like, these people are just idiots. You know, I don't know. Who knows what's going on? So I think it's it's difficult to speculate. But um, certainly at this point in time, her legacy is, ve- is very poor. And her, her, sp- image, her image is is now being, that's been broken, hasn't it? That 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 image of, of um, being a... Um, top politician, a, a great worker, and a great um, a leader, because that's what her you keep hearing from even the press in in, in London. She's a great yeah. leader. She's a great well. They were just using her to bash Boris over Brexit mainly. That's really what that was about. But um, the thing is, you know, she wasn't. She wasn't. I, I don't really like this idea. Is a great leader is someone who actually perform and who does the things that they're supposed to do and the role they're supposed to do. So it doesn't. If she's jetting off to COP twenty eight or twenty six, whatever it is, then that's not really what she's supposed to be doing. She's supposed to be fixing the potholes. Everyone would be happy if the potholes were fixed. Everyone would be happy if there's kids go to school and there were more teacher places and stuff like that. But the headlines are always like all this other stuff, and people are like, well, just concentrate and be boring in a way. We don't really want people doing all that type of thing. It's it's a regional administration, and that's one of the problems with the parliament in general. It's jumped up for for what its uh, role should be. And it really should just be, you know, local count, the, the head of the various councils coming together to uh, figure work out their spending. That's it. There's very little, I think, that is stuff that is required, that is Scotland-wide that is required. So, um, but back to Sturgeon, I think, the yeah, it, it, it's just some style over substance really and at a certain point people go well it's just like the emperor's new clothes it's really. really surprised because what always surprises me is people like that normally in politics they get found out quite easily and quite quickly <laughs> and they get moved on especially in positions of power are you surprised at how long <laughs> sturgeon was able to do this uh, without any kind of substance, without any kind of successes, and she was first minister, and she won eight elections. Yeah, as I said, it's a, I think it's momentum. People are voting for the party, voting for the ideal, voting for not necessarily voting, and some were voting for her because she appeared to be competent at that point. But when the ideal is gone, the and when she's gone, and what's what's left really? You've got. Um, Alex Salmon to try to pick up the scraps. It's demeaning. It's like you know, go and retire already. You're not going to get anywhere with this thing at all. And um, you know, and and now we've got the resurgence of Labour and Labour's people are going. Oh, there's an alternative for uh, socialists or people who are anti-Tory. Anyway, would say, well, I've got an alternative. I can actually go on the winning side. I can get rid of the Tories. And I can be part of the solution rather than carping from the from the sides. And we're seeing increasingly uh, the SNP being, being in disarray 
now um, because they don't know where their position is. They don't know how to deal with resurgent labour at all. And all they're saying, well, we'll fight the Tories. You're like, no, actually, this, these guys over here are going to do that uh, for good or bad. Um, anyway, but so, um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of... I'm a big believer in political gravity. That's the thing I knew. It... it it might appear to have had appeared to have so much momentum, but at some point it inevitably would have would, would fail. I, I actually didn't expect it to fail it quite spectacularly mm-hmm. as it has. But we've still got a long way to go. We still have to really educate people, Scots, to say why. Why did you let this person do this? Why were you so easily fooled by these promises? Mm-hmm. And why were you? Why did you so easily com, uh, indulge in casual Anglophobia? Why did you? Why, why did you want to build a wall with your neighbours? Are you nuts? This is that type of thing. I mean, that's the thing we need to get back to and say what this is. This was actually a crazy time, a mass delusion in Scottish politics and in Scottish life, and. People need to understand their part in it. It's not enough for some of these people who say, oh, I found out, I've discovered Nicola Sturgeon was a charlatan, so I'm, uh, you know, I, uh, that's terrible, but I'm still committed to uh, in Scottish independence. You're like, well, why? You're still committed to putting a wall up, right? Why are you doing that? That's the core problem. The core problem is there, not Nicola Sturgeon. So we need to have a... Not necessarily. I don't think it'll be a national conversation as such, but it will be a, an understanding that will seep through the population. To say, what the hell were we doing there? And this, you know, because it was fifteen years of SNP, and it just turned into a big mess. And we are somehow responsible for that. So, what is each person has should um, look inside themselves, I suppose, and 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 understand. What they whether they were against it or for it, and why why they didn't do the things they perhaps should have done. Welcome back, and now it's the quick fire oh, questions round. Okay. All right, well, I haven't prepared any answers here. I don't know what this, I don't know what you're going nope. to ask me. I've not I've not informed. I'm not going to inform any of the guests what the questions are. I'm right. going to ask three questions. Or three, okay. And I want whatever comes into mind. Oh, God, uh, okay. So I'm going to question one. Will we see branch form come to a conclusion before the general election? <laughs> do you think there will be any charges? Yes, I think there will be charges. I have no inside information about it, but I do think there will be charges. You wouldn't have an investigation this long without it. And I think that... I would. I hope that the election will be earlier rather than later. We can't, as a country, I mean the UK, uh, put up with this pain anymore. It's just the longer it drags I'm on, the worse it's going to be. For an answer, do, on, on do you think the branch form will be concluded though any time in the next six months? Yes. Yes. Question two: How many seats will the SNP lose at the general election? Oh, yeah, lots, lots. I think it'll be more than expected. More than 30? Well, I don't, I don't know the calculations, but I think whatever the average is of, of expectation, it's going to be more than that. I think people are going to... I think they're going to be punished for their behaviour. And question three. Will Humza Useless be First Minister... Uh, after the after the general election, no, no, before, no. before before the Holyrood elections, I'll say before. No, the no, of course he's going. To, he's going to go. He'll be kicked out by the party um, after the election, but it won't matter who's the next person. They're, 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 there's no way back now. I think we'll hopefully get back to the situation where the uh, SNP is just a bunch of cranks and anglophobes. And it's oil uh, oil types, which they've all been, which they've all. I think they've always been. It's yeah. just a protest party, and just and get back to that even less because people won't take them seriously. I think, um, and of course, I think the other things the UK will move to make at some point to make make it harder for them to to get ahead with their plans in any way. But 
I think we had this time 15 years of uh, division, chaos, incompetence. Uh, and of course, we still have, well, it's politics. So, of course, those things will still happen, but hopefully not uh, under the name of uh, trying to break up the UK. Well, that's that section done, Mark. Uh, I'm going to, uh, and thank you for uh, joining me tonight. Now, nice after pleasure. the break, I'm going to hear the, the last section, which is uh, Ziggy's rant, where I'll be having a little rant about um, anything that's been going on in, in, in Scotland. So after this break, it's the Ziggy's rant. See you in a minute. All right. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much for having me on board. And we'll see you again soon. Thank you, Matt. And it's time for Ziggy's rant. And my rant tonight is about uh, the Greens. Not so much uh, what's happened with Ross Greer, because I touched on that earlier in my Ziggy's rant podcast. So uh, uh, what I want to talk about is the party, the Greens, who have been taken over by an extremist part of, uh, of the party, uh, we know him, Chapman, Greer, uh, Harvey, uh, so on. We, we, uh, these people have taken over the party. So what, what are they? What is the Greens? Are they a party of envir envir environmental party? I, I don't think so. I think they've become uh, a dangerous offset and they've taken over the party. And I'd like to know where the 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 green side of the party is and what why are they not pushing back against this extremist behavior of the protests the um the bottle scheme the the the, the anti-business that we're seeing from uh, these people and nothing on the environment so it's about time the members of the green party took their party back and uh, removed these extremists from their party. Uh, that's my rant for tonight. So that's the end of my first podcast. I'd like to thank Mark uh, Devlin for from the Majority Show for joining me for um, a great discussion we've had tonight on on Sturgeon and the fall and rise of Sturgeon. So um, thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. And um, I'll see you next time. Thank you very much.